This tutorial is all about the history of the atom, how ideas have changed over very many years since the days of John Dalton here on the left, who first came up with the idea of atoms being single, uh, solid as it were, pieces of elements through the work of people like Niels Bohr and Ernest Rutherford and Geiger and Muller. Sorry, can't remember their first names. Uh, anyway, we'll go through some of the history of the atom and how ideas have developed. Now, because these names of the scientists are on the specification, you're going to need to know some of the facts here. There's not a great deal of understanding. It is sheer learning of facts. So we've got uh, guys like Dalton, J.J. Thompson, Rutherford, and Boer, Geiger, and Marsden, uh, all sorts of people there. So as I said at the beginning, uh, John Dalton uh, developed an atomic theory in the 1800s. Um, he kind of got the idea that atoms were making up elements and that atoms combined together in particular ratios and got the idea of formulas being fixed, so for example water being H2O and not H3O or H2.5O. Uh, so the main things he came up with was that all matter was made of atoms and atoms couldn't be broken down into anything simpler. Of course at this stage John Dalton knew nothing about what was inside an atom. He thought that they I suppose were a bit like ball bearings or marbles in that they were kind of solid bits um, and he knew that they combined together to make compounds, but he had no concept of what was inside an atom, or indeed that anything was inside an atom. J.J. Thompson, his work was important because he discovered the electron in 1897, and he was the first person really to show that atoms weren't just composed of one thing, but they actually were composed of more than one subatomic particle. And then Ernest Rutherford used experimental evidence to show that atoms must contain a central nucleus. And this was further evidence that atoms contained smaller pieces. You see that once one scientist has come up with a theory, then he or she will normally write a scientific paper that's published and read by other scientists or will appear at various conferences around the world and other scientists will come and listen to what that scientist has to say and then we'll go away and do further work to test this scientist theory and try and find more evidence. So once there was evidence that there were particles inside an atom, scientists all went looking for further evidence of particles. Niels Bohr further developed the idea of there being a nucleus and electrons around the outside and his work supported the idea that electrons weren't just randomly arranged within the atom but were on particular levels or shells such as we learn in school now. So it's important to understand that like any theory, the theory of atomic structure uh, is an example of where a scientist does a piece of work, um, publishes their work, and then the theory is either accepted because other scientists find more evidence to support it, or the theory is challenged because other scientists test that theory and find evidence that conflicts with it, uh, which means that they have to write another theory. Sometimes this evidence that challenges or supports a theory comes by accident. Geiger and Marsden's experiment is one such example. Before their experiment, J.J. Thompson had put forward the idea that the electrons were fairly randomly scattered through the atom, a little bit like a plum pudding or what you might think of as a currant bun or a blueberry muffin. Uh, in other words, that the atom was a sphere of positive charge with kind of negative electrons dotted randomly within it. Now, Rutherford designed an experiment to test this model and asked for his assistants, Geiger and Marsden, to fire a beam of alpha particles, which are like helium nucleuses, at some very, very thin gold foil. And 
because it was thought that the positive charge and the electrons were pretty diffusely arranged within the atom that these particles would just sail straight through this very thin gold foil but they were surprised to find that in fact they didn't and many of them bounced back at odd angles. Um, Rutherford concluded from that that there must be some pretty solid parts within the atom. In other words, he postulated that there was a central nucleus which was dense and heavy and could bounce off these particles. So, as a result of this experiment, which essentially sent back results that weren't expected, uh, the whole idea of what an atom looked like changed from being one which had positiveness and negativeness fairly uh, diffusely or evenly distributed to being one where there was definitely a central part or a nucleus to the atom with electrons arranged around the outside of it. It was then down to Niels Bohr to come up with the idea that the electrons around the outside of the nucleus weren't just randomly arranged but they were arranged in separate energy levels which we call now shells. Here's a past paper question. Many scientists helped to develop the theory of atomic structure in the early 1900s. A scientist called Thompson discovered the electron. Another scientist called Rutherford had the idea of atoms having a nucleus. And a third scientist called Bohr had the idea of electron shells. Now look at this diagram. It shows the structure of an atom with a nucleus, electrons and electron shells. Explain why the nucleus of an atom has a positive charge. It contains protons... which have a positive charge and neutrons which have no charge. The scientists Thompson, Rutherford and Bohr told other scientists about their ideas about atoms, suggest how and why they told other scientists. Uh, first of all, how they would have written scientific papers and spoken at conferences. They did this. So, other scientists could test their theory, or theories, and look for further evidence to support or extend their ideas. And here's the answer. Uh, why is it positive? Because in the nucleus the protons are positive, the uh, neutrons are neutral. And why did they do it and how did they do it? Use of conferences, use of books, use of journals for one mark, and then telling others uh, allow peer review by other scientists, evaluation, checking the work, repeating their experiments, other scientists to develop their work. Obviously in those days they didn't publish their results by video or TV or internet or the telephone because these were new technologies which hadn't been invented in those days.